mums giving recipes doesn't help though. They'll be like, "Ha, thora sa ye." I don't know, yeah. just ऐसी वो डाल दो नमक भी डालो. And you're like, "Kitna?" And they're like, "Jaise bhi, just dekh lo." And you're like, "What?" Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's that's exactly what my mom would say except in Punjabi. She'd be like, "Bas munasib, bas dekh le na, theek ho jaye bas." Yo, hisab kar le, wo abhi abhi theek lagna shuru ho jayega. The maza aana shuru ho jayega. I'm like, yes, "Okay." Yes, exactly. Welcome back to Popcorn. I am your host Habib Ahmed. Each episode I discuss a different topic with different guests from all over the world and we all have one thing in common. Pakistan. Today I would like you to meet our special guest Arfa. She's 22 years old from England. Well, firstly, I just want to say salam and I love these podcasts. So thank you for having me. So my name's Arfa or Arfa like the Arabic. I'm 22 in UK. A little bit about myself. I'm a human geography graduate since last June, and after uni, I took about eight months off to just do nothing. My grandparents were like, "Ab kya karogi?" and I was like, "Just nana, mujhe sona." <laughs> If you've been keeping up with the podcast, you might remember Arfa from our previous two episodes. She's a new and active guest on the podcast lately. While the last two episodes were group episodes, this one is dedicated just to her. We learn a little bit more about her, her life and discover her passion for food. She is so passionate for food that she wrote her dissertation on it. You ask anyone that knows me, the word Arifa or Ari just means food. My dissertation was on food. My first job was yeah. in a restaurant. Like everything about me is just about food. <laughs> about food. Yeah. Arifa reached out to me more than a year ago, back in late 2018, and expressed interest in coming on the podcast as a guest. She told me, "I'm also doing my dissertation on British Pakistanis and food consumption." Laugh emoji. After that, she got busy with her dissertation, and we didn't speak actually until recently, when she became more active in our Pakor community online. And now here she is today. I focused a lot on my youth group, so I co-run a youth group for about ten years, and now I have a job at the National Trust. If you're in England, you would have heard of it. It's essentially a conservation charity for heritage sites, I guess. So, what does it mean? Can you clarify human geography? What exactly is that? Oh, everyone asks me what's human geography. It's essentially the study of society, space, and cultures. Oh. It encompasses politics, business, uh, sociology, some engineering when it comes to you know sustainability stuff. But honestly, we study everything. It's a course about understanding. Geography is a study of the world. Human geography is a study of the humans in the world. So right. So not so much the natural world. It's more like uh, cities yeah. and. Yeah. But obviously, it crosses over. So it's hard to yeah. just talk about humans on their own. You have to talk about where they live, the architecture that we're in, why the homes are created the way they're created. You could literally point at any object in your room right now. and we could do an entire lecture on the geography of that product you know the oh, yeah. commodity chain of it or where it came from or who made it how is it marketed to you and blah 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 <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah that's true that's true and i have a job so anyone who wants to do geography do it and you can get a job with it because everyone says geography or sikyagurugi like you know you can get mm -hmm. a job with it you can actually get a job really easily with geography so just mm -hmm. do it if you want to do it Tell us a little bit about your family. How many siblings do you have? So I'm the youngest of three. I'm 22. Then my brother is 24. My sister is 26. So we're quite close in age. It's just us three. My mum is from England. My grandparents both moved to England. They lived in Bradford, which is North England. You might have heard of it because it has the largest Pakistani yeah. population. Right. I think it's got like 20. 26% or something like that. And my dad is from Karachi. And you were born in England, right? Yes. Yeah. That's why I'm always confused. Am I third generation? If you look at my mum's side, third generation, my dad's side I'm second. So or first, I don't know. Acha. Urdu aati hai? Ha, Urdu aati hai. Lekin hum ghar pe sirf angrezi mein bolte hai to meri urdu itni achhi nahi hai. Matlab parents ke sath bhi English mein baat karti ho? Ha. Uh -huh. Well, mix. We do like hmm. this gulabi English, Gulabi Urdu kind of thing. Yeah, Urglish a little bit. Yeah, exactly. Growing up, my dad always spoke to us in Urdu, even though he knows English. 
and my mum like switched and my mum was adamant that we have to learn Urdu. That's good, right. So you're at a point where they're like comfortable. They're like, I don't see clear Urdu. For all these years, we've been twisting our tongues trying to teach <laughs> exactly. them this language. Well, I think it helped my mum improve her Urdu as well. So yeah, and we love the language, so we don't care uh, mm-hmm. really. And my dad's more comfortable speaking Urdu anyway. He always speaks Urdu. Um, yeah. It actually got to the point where when we got older, we were begging them to speak. I think the the podcast you did with Akil, the coconut one, he yeah. kind of spoke about this where we're trying to get our parents to speak to us in Urdu to improve our Urdu now we're older. Um, but now they're just unwilling to do it. I don't know why. And when mm. we respond in Urdu, we, they'll take the piss out of us because of our accent. <laughs> so it's hard uh, to learn sometimes. It's hard to practice. Yeah. It does sound <laughs> funny though. <laughs> Right, right, right. I, they I know can't what you not mean. laugh when we get our genders wrong, you know? Um, yeah. That's the main mistake that we make. <laughs> I, I know exactly what you mean. Exactly. I think the thing that helped me was when I went to university, I got really interested in getting better at my own language. I think because I'd lived with non-English people and they all knew a second language as well. So, mm. so I don't know. I think it really got to me and I was like, I want to learn my language more. And it, it brought that pride back into Urdu. And I watched like loads of YouTube with yeah. Pakistani comedians or even in Hindi, like it helps. I think there's like yeah. that dice media or something. So I think this is because I moved around a lot and I was so displaced with my identity yeah. that it made me want to cling on to it. And also my mother's love for her identity. I think that mm. kind of came through to us but I have noticed I'm different in that way that a lot of people growing up especially as a child they didn't really care for taking pride in their own Pakistani culture or Muslim culture or you know Mm -hmm. even the white British people I meet like it's just not a thing like people don't really think about identity that much and culture that much but I've always been really interested in it and captivated by knowing who I am and knowing my language knowing different the right ways to do things but yeah I do find myself different in that way but that Mm. is definitely because I lived here and there and I didn't have one place of home as a kid I think. I We talk about identity crisis in pretty much every other episode I would say on the podcast it's such a common topic but if for most people I guess there's kind of a bias here because for most people that I speak to they're on the podcast because they have some connection they have some affection for this background of theirs, right? I don't often <laughs> bring exactly. on the guests who yeah, don't true. have that level of interest because because I'm often comparing people like you who are born abroad uh, to people like, you know, a few of my cousins and a lot of the Pakistanis I see here growing up and they don't have that type of interest, right? Yeah, exactly. But I, I need to drag one of them to the <laughs> podcast some point. <laughs> Yeah, actually, anti Pakistani podcast. Hai, yeah, <laughs> just bring yeah, one exactly. like that. Let's, let's just talk, talk smack about Pakistan. <laughs> <laughs> I would actually get a lot of takers for that. <laughs> Arfa has moved around quite a bit with her family from England to Saudi Arab to Italy and then back to England. So I'm born in England. As I said, my mother was born in England um, up north in Bradford. So we, all three of us were born in Bradford. My dad had settled there, obviously, when he married my mum. Then his first big break was in Saudi. He's an engineer, in hmm. petrochemical engineer. And anyone in Saudi, if they hear the city Jebel, they all know we were there for work because that's an area that you go for work. From what my mother tells me, we had a lot of Pakistani neighbours. So they all spoke Urdu. In England, a lot of the Pakistanis that we live with speak Punjabi. So Urdu was actually my first language. I was the youngest. I was born and they moved straight to Saudi Arabia until I was three. And I spoke to all the neighbors' children in Urdu. Uh, That was where my parents first moved. And that's where they made their first footing in life. So we have a big like Arab like influence, not culturally, but through food and decorations Mm. in our house still. (laughs) Um, Then we moved to, so after three years, we moved to Italy. And that's Mm -hmm. where I predominantly grew up in my early childhood until I was about 10. So first we went to Milano, uh, Milan, sorry, and then Rome. And then I came to England when I was about 10. 
So I got the last year of primary school and then high school or whatever you call it uh, until now. So I'm mm. 22, had 10 years out of England and now mm. I've been here since. So it's weird because like I'm English, but since I was born, I haven't been in England. So I have a coming to England story, which <laughs> isn't a thing that people usually have. Right. Yeah. So if I talk to people here and I say, oh, when I came to England, that's what I thought was weird. And they're like, oh, where are you from? India or something. And I'm like, no, <laughs> I've actually <laughs> never been there. I didn't even go to yeah. Pakistan. <laughs> yeah. In between, did you go to Pakistan a lot? How often did you go back? From my memory, not a lot. I know I went, when we were in Saudi, we went. So as I said, my first language was Urdu just because yeah. of like that time. I must have been mm -hmm. until three-ish that we went there and my mum actually has a beautiful story where my bird nani was still alive and I went to Karachi and she was like I'm gonna go for a walk with her and we went all around the block and came back and we were yabbering on and my mum was like how was she did she speak and she said that she could speak to me more than she could speak to my mum when she was younger because mm. she was like, Tum ko urdu bhi aati thi. And, and she was like laughing and she was like, I loved it. It was such a beautiful time. And then when we were in Italy, I think we went to Pakistan once when there was a wedding, the classic. I must have been 12. And then mm. what's beautiful was I never went back until I graduated university last June. So there was a 10 year gap between seeing Karachi when I was 12 and seeing Karachi when I was 22 and yeah. the experience was so different and it was so lovely like I just really yeah. liked that you understood a lot more and I had connected to my culture a lot more I've just grown up so hmm. yeah it was lovely my parents complained a lot more last last summer because they were like oh yeah. Karachi used to be so clean I wish you guys saw it um my yeah. dad was talking about how the weather is so different from when he was growing up and just like little things like that. But that didn't bother me at all because I had no sense of before. Exactly. There's no baseline. I couldn't really remember anything bad yeah. from before. I just didn't think anything was bad. They had things to complain about, like, no, before it was like this, before it was like that. It was better. But yeah. to me, everything is just beautiful. Yeah. Um, especially coming from England, you see, like, everyone's wearing color and that's just nice. There's sun. That's mm -hmm. great. There's markets. There's people moving. I'm not from a city, so I'm not actually in London and you can get anything done in Karachi it's incredible like I was showing all my friends from uni like what Karachi's like mm -hmm. I think I took some of my friends stuff as well to fix and I showed them like you can go to the market I'll get three suits made in like and in the same day I'll get these watches done my glasses and they were like whoa this is so cool mm -hmm. <laughs> the whole time I was fascinated because wow. we don't get to see it done you just order something on Amazon or True, you go true. to the shop and they're like, I'll come back in two weeks and pick mm -hmm. it up. Everything's boring here. You just drive, you go, <laughs> yeah, you pay. Yeah, yeah. You know, you don't see. Instant. You get everything like instantly, right? It's like a magic box. Whatever you want, you get it. But you don't know how it's being done. Exactly. And you don't have as much control over the designing of things unless you have a load of money. Yeah. Um, so that's what's cool like in Karachi. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even... I notice this a lot in America. I don't know how it is in UK, London, but over here, the houses are so homogenous, like they're so similar. And oftentimes that's the reason for that is because there's a construction company that has three or four designs, three or four different types of um, blueprints, and they're just going to build every house in a row based <laughs> on those blueprints. So there's not mm -hmm. a lot of room for customization. Uh, there is some customization, True. but it's not like when you go to Pakistan, it's so beautiful. You don't know who's going to be. Like, like really customized designs. I've, like my uncles, when they built their house, they actually had a lot of control over... They're not architects. Um, they're not architects at all. But they were mm. doing work like architects. They, were, they knew exactly what they wanted done, I guess. And Yeah. But that's the thing. You can get anything done. There's no like... The main problem in England is... Okay, it's not a problem. Obviously, I'm grateful for yeah. it. But there's health and safety. Health and safety, health and safety, health and safety. Everything has to be mm -hmm. approved. You know, there's no like room yeah. for the imagination. In Pakistan, you can be like, actually, no, I want this designed like this. And no one knows how to do it, but they'll yeah. get it done. They'll figure yeah. it out. 
you'll pay them and it will be that like you know you can get anything customized from a skirting board to a door or you know to a house yeah I don't know. <laughs> right you're you just need a lot of money to be imaginative and just be yeah. like no actually do that as long as you have a bit of money to do that Here's where the episode really starts heading into a topic that we all love, food. The way we head into the food topic is by Arfa telling us a story of her time traveling by train in Pakistan, which she really enjoyed by the way. She told me how she loved traveling by train in Pakistan and she tells us a story of how there were certain Urdu words all over the train which she found amusing. And after a few minutes of speaking about Urdu, we start diving into the topic of food and stay there for a long, long time. So they had words written in Urdu everywhere and I found it funny that they wrote Dasturkhan like on the bin, like proper mm-hmm. old and style like garbage bin. Mm-hmm. And you know the people who yeah. sell stuff throughout the train? Mm-hmm. Um, I found that really funny. They were just yeah. like shouting and everyone's so accustomed to it and desensitized mm-hmm. to it. But yeah. those are the things you pick up as a tourist. So um, yeah, I was loving life. That, that's also kind of interesting actually. You You made me think of something which is you know, Dastar Khan, for example, when I was learning Arabic, I remember there was often a word for every, each type of English, like word that you wouldn't imagine would have a translation in Arabic. Mm-hmm. Um, they actually did have a word for that. For a simple example, uh, the word computer. If I remember correctly, there was a word for computer in Arabic. I don't really? know how often people use it. Yeah. Let me, oh, let me I see learned if I it was it. just computer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> that's that's how it is in Urdu. <laughs> uh, computer. In I did an but Arabic I class, this. and they were like, "Just say computer and like television." Yeah. yeah. So there is a word. I just googled it. It's a al al hasub, al hasub. Oh, wow. So, but but I don't know because yeah, like your co- like your teacher might have said, right? I don't know if it's actually used in practical, you yeah. know, speaking of Arabic. But it's cool that it's there. But at least even. it exists. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Because in Urdu, that's that's the issue, I think. In Urdu, we, at some point, we just stop making words. And exactly. not only stop making, but then we have words and we don't use them. Like, we just say garbage or, you know, trash bin. <laughs> uh, <laughs> instead of, you know, garmi yeah. Like, when I speak Urdu with my parents, I'll be like, garbage ke te ga. Or... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Wo, wo glass de do. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, wait, yeah. there isn't a word for glass, right? I sent yeah, one. Yeah, glass. Did you say glass? Did you we- see? Did you see the word I sent in the group though for glass? Abhora. Oh, is that, is that the glass? Yeah. Abhora. Well, anyone listening can verify. Mm. I guess. I guess this would be really good for poetry. I think because these types of words are definitely not being used day to day, but yeah. um, at some point, uh, I'm sure they they should be used. Urdu is such a rich language, but I'll never get to know that depth of it because I haven't even got mm-hmm. to the basic. <laughs> Um, and there's so many words we don't use anymore, which is sad. And even for me, that's that's the thing. If I don't speak Urdu for a w- long time, I just, uh, you know, actually f- something funny comes to mind. When I went to Pakistan last time and I was coming back to the US, I had a layover in Manchester, UK. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> I remember in that airport, uh, they, you know, they make you come out of the plane. They do the, all these stupid security checks on you. Ugh, even yeah. back then, you have to go through this whole process again, getting your bags checked, your passport and all that uh, really long line. And I remember mm-hmm. the, uh, the the security agent of whatever they are, he tried talking to me. He seemed like a police officer. And he was just mm-hmm. like, uh, how, how's your how's your trip going? And I struggled to answer. I forgot how to speak English. What? What do you mean? And <laughs> this, this, yeah, this is a weird thing. I, I think <laughs> so funny. I, I'm much more comfortable with English than Urdu. But I was in Pakistan for three that months. That happens though. He, he was like, uh, how's, your, how's your flight? I was like, uh, it was long. <laughs> <laughs> good <laughs> yeah so i, I think that's that a testament to you though because it just yeah. means um it just shows how immersed you get when you go to yeah. somewhere especially like pakistan obviously you will get immersed because you know the language but it means that you fully got immersed to the point where you were just speaking urdu predominantly mm-hmm. um so yeah yeah that's good. exactly what's weird is when i moved out to uni that's i told yeah. you that's when i got really interested in learning urdu a bit more and i was less embarrassed to practice at home because no one could hear me and no one that knew Urdu could hear me. So I would yeah. practice a lot and listen to it a lot. And I found these podcasts too. So that really helped me. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when I would find an uncle here or there, I would speak to them. I mean, in a shop 
like a shopkeeper, not like randomly. <laughs> um, and I practiced. And when I came home, I would speak in English and I struggled when I went back, which is so backwards. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> But yeah. Did you feel awkward uh, speaking English in Pakistan at all? Uh, no, I, you know what? I never feel awkward anywhere. I think just who I am. Um, and since I had practiced so much at uni, my Urdu has got a lot better over the past couple of years. And my all my family say so. And I mm. can fully cook every. I made sure I could cook everything. Yeah. Desi. We're a very Desi family anyway. Um, mm. So when I went to Pakistan at first, my Urdu wasn't great, but I was adamant that I will speak it even if I'm really bad at it. Mm -hmm. And my family were really encouraging, actually. They didn't like make fun out of me or anything. That's they, good. yeah, so they helped me. And after a week or two, you can just speak it like mm -hmm. more comfortably. By the next month, I was speaking Urdu all the time and, you know, it was fine. Mm. Nice, nice. So speaking of cooking, actually. Where did you learn to cook? Was it your mom who taught you mostly? Yeah, so um, my mom always got us engaged in food since we were, to be honest, toddlers. Mm. And food was one of the main ways she taught us our identities. So she would always make Pakistani dinners because that's what my dad wanted to eat. He's Pakistani. Being Pakistani, he cannot have a pizza <laughs> once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> exactly maybe pizza but like yeah he's not interested in mashed potato or oh yeah you know like I'm, i'm honestly very similar to that yeah i know yeah which is fair enough you know what yeah. he would actually be really happy if you just gave him dal chawal every day hmm. um which yeah i think yeah. a lot of people would be happy by if yeah so our yeah. dinners would always be desi then our lunches my mom would probably try and have like something british While he's at work mm. and then breakfast we would just like have egg or and yeah. like omelette or something mm -hmm. and she always had us engaged in the kitchen or let us watch her or when she was making parade i would be the one that spreads the butter or the ghee on it mm -hmm. and cut it and roll it up and my sister would watch my mom build it and my brother would learn to sick the rotis and we would all get involved and then we'd all eat out of a wait wow. i always say the wrong one dasla you know Like one big plate. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. I okay. almost said that, like but that's what you cook the roti on. Yeah. yeah that's yeah. like one right. proper metal. Right. Yeah. But yeah, since we were about five onwards, I think it's a testament to my mom. She's the one who got us really engaged in food. That's how we learned yeah. British so food, cool. Pakistani food. Obviously, everything's halal. So that's not the way we learned um, Islam. But yeah, so. We were in Italy. It's not a Muslim country. It's not an English country and it's not a Pakistani country. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to eat British and Pakistani as well as Italian. Yeah, I'm a big fan of cuisines. I love cuisines. Italian is yes. a really good one. I, I do get tired of pasta, so I can't do pasta every every day like a lot of people can. But I do like, yeah. a, you know, a, a Italian cuisine. I understand it at least. I love Mexican. I love Japanese Thai. Ooh. So, you know, I, I love going out and eating, but then I'm probably very similar to your dad. When I come home, I like really crave something they see at the oh, end of the that, day. That's, like, that's just different, isn't it? Like, Karkakana has to be like Karkakana, you know? Yeah, exactly. But what I was going to ask was uh, <laughs> you mentioned British food. I don't know much about British cuisine outside of fish and chips. I knew you would ask this and nothing, yeah. <laughs> it's bad because nothing springs to mind really when you say British food. I guess mm -hmm. it's fish and chips. Ironically, curry is like the national yeah. dish. Yeah, but... chicken tikka masala, right? So people say like uh, that's a national <laughs> dish of, of uh, UK. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think most cultures will have some form of meat, mm. potatoes and a carb in various different ways. So that's, if you think of those basics, then you can map out what the national dishes are from there. So if I think of yeah. it that way, British food would be potatoes either roasted mashed mm. a lot of things baked so they have baked vegetables you've got like different types of pies not i think in america you call pies like sweet stuff but we have like mm. everything savory like shepherd's pie and uh, uh, cottage yeah. pie that kind of thing right then you've got the their carb like ours would be jowl theirs would be breads like loads of different types of bread there's soda bread there's the british love bakeries and bread mm. for some reason Yeah, I think that those are the main dishes. It's all about, to be honest, yeah. it's all about potatoes, like chips. There's hundreds of types of chips. <laughs> um, 
I mean, I, I think people also get confused when you say American food because there really isn't. True. That's true. Any such thing. It's basically, you know, oftentimes people confuse Italian things as American. Yeah, true. And then Italians get offended by that. Sometimes they're like, well, pizza is ours. It's not American. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the difficult so. thing because we, those countries are the, you know, the colonizers, as you'd say. So everything is, yeah. you know, mainly imported and yeah. yeah. Right. So it's hard to place what is actually British, you know? Yeah. Right. Um, I remember uh, a while ago, I got into Gordon Ramsay. He's probably my favorite TV yes. chef. So my sister got him, got me into him. She really, uh, you know, told me to watch him. And I think it was mostly the F-bombs and the cursing uh, that got me into it. Because I was like, wow, cooking and cursing. That's a, that's a unique combination. I love it. It's like watching a mafia movie. <laughs> but, but, on, uh, but cooking, it's, it's great. Gordon is the best. He's awesome. Yeah, I, I love him. So you know what bothers me? What I learned uh, recently, maybe a few years ago, was yep. all these years I was eating fish and chips outside. I didn't know that apparently... Yep. The fish is battered in, in beer. It's covered in beer. Yep. And yep. I don't know. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> no, no, you're right. When my mom was younger, so I told you Bradford is one of the highest populations of Pakistani community. Yeah. And obviously back in the day, there was a lot of racism. I think Akhil talked about that a lot in his podcast in terms of Paki bashing. That was probably one of the worst places for it. Mm. Um, anywhere you have like a migrant population, there's going to be conflict. Yeah. Um, but people would do things on purpose. So the fish and chip shops, in order to keep them our British fish and chip shops kind of thing, they would add pig lard into the oil. Hmm. And now now that's banned. Um, but a lot of places still do that. They put animal fat in the oil or in the batter or something like that. So you yeah. have to check. What was ironic was, so I studied in Coventry, which... I was obsessed with because you see so much diversity, even more than London there, especially in terms of cuisine, you could see every type of cuisine possible and everything was halal. So it was great. Mm. But there was one fish and chip shop on the corner and they had vegan, they had a whole vegan menu, which I thought was so odd for a fish and chip place. Like, why are you even bothering to have a vegan <laughs> menu? <laughs> like it's supposed to be fish, you know? Um, right. And I went in and they said I can have fish, but their oil had that in it. So they would cook what are they called. There's these sausage things in batter, like pig sausage things in batter mm. that are cooked with the fish. Oh no. Yeah. Yeah. So I couldn't have that. And then the vegan menu isn't fish and I wanted fish. Yeah. So they said for Muslims, they actually go in the back and they fry our fish separate, which I thought was so lovely. Um, and just out of curiosity, I asked them what the vegan oil was and they said it was 100% palm oil, which I thought was really ironic because it's like a really contentious oil now. I know mm. there's not actually, if you look into the palm oil industry, there's like, it's yeah. not something we should be boycotting. It should be something that we're like mitigating and changing the ways like, you know, we do things. So, mm. But anyway, regardless, there's a lot of vegan community that are heavily mm. against palm oil so i thought it was so ironic that they cooked yeah. their food in 100 percent palm oil i was yeah. like are you sure you should be doing that <laughs> um but yeah it's really common it's really common for like the the oil to not be vegetarian mm. my mom said a lot of people knew that growing up actually and they would just be like even with like harry bows they would mm. know the gelatin had like pork gelatin in it and the kids would just be like la 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 i can't hear you and they would eat it all <laughs> and then be like oh what did you say Oh yeah. no, it's the for love. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. It's the same over here. You still have a lot of kids eating candy, like gelatinous yeah. candy. But it's just like I guess uh, some people start thinking like you know, uncontrolled Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We just got to eat what we got to eat, but yeah. Others are more I think strict up about until it, of course. about like yeah, I think it was a lot more strict until about 6 ish years ago when they kind of ruled that mm -hmm. it's so processed that there's not much animal anything yeah. remnants in in it mm -hmm. but before that there definitely was it was um, yeah but i think right. people are less strict now because they're like it's so processed it's mm -hmm. fine the vegan movement might <laughs> might be indirectly helping us at least because i think vegans make a lot of noise exactly that's the thing yes definitely. as much as i feel like uh, muslims get blamed for making noise i don't think they make half as much noise as vegans and 
<laughs> it's so true. <laughs> and vegans are a much smaller minority of people. So, but yeah, yeah they, they're out there marching. They're standing in front of the milk stands at, <laughs> at stores, right? Telling us to not to fair, buy it and stuff. The smallest minorities have to make the biggest noise to get heard. Yeah, um, right. And but, I guess but, it works. Yeah, <laughs> it does work. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes you have to go a bit extreme. Do you remember what was one of the first few dishes that you learned from your mom? Uh, Pakistani? Yeah. Or just in general? Or, or in general. In general, probably like one of the first things you might have learned is to make an egg or something. Yes, it was. We would always make like hada. The thing is, we didn't actually know the English. Or oh, maybe we did, but I never used to call egg by its English names. Like we always said like hada mm. and, you know, um, when I came to England, mm. I had to learn them and use those only. Um, Wait, English names? Sorry, go ahead. Uh, what, what did you say? Like hard duff, a scrambled egg. Wait, what do you call oh, it? Oh, well, I, I don't know. I don't know if there is a word for scrambled egg. <laughs> there there probably is. I did not know it. Uh, oh, okay. We just call it undah. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, okay. We'd Again, make, like, like well, I'll call it scrambled undah. <laughs> <laughs> one of my Fried favorite, one of my favorite yeah. eggs actually is what my dad used to make out of yeah. leftover. You know, undah gadala? My favorite. Uh, no, no. What? It's basically like, if you get a leftover salad, I mean, this isn't how mm. you make it, but if you get a leftover salad and you put that in a scrambled egg with mm. like maybe some tomatoes and stuff like that, it's basically an egg curry. It's the oh. best thing ever with roti. It's so nice. Yeah. See, I'm pretty sure I've had these things, but I just don't know what they, that they were called these things. Oh, that's So fair. that's interesting. Yeah. yeah but yeah. I, I'm pretty sure because my mom, for example, she, she has done that actually, but there's just curry left over. You cook, you boil eggs separately and then you throw it in the curry and then you can keep eating. Ooh, yeah. Well, there are actual salons with like boiled eggs. Yeah. 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 Sometimes she's made like boiled eggs with uh, kofte. Yes. In, in, in shorba. That comes out really good. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the first things I started cooking was a Sunday omelette every day for about three years. Mm. And I think that's what got me really into food. The other mm. thing that got me into cooking was I changed my diet a lot in school. So I went like paleo and stuff like that. And uh, you really have to be conscious of your ingredients and variety and food. And it made mm -hmm. me like try loads of different things. And the first kind of desi things my mom taught us was she always used to show us, every, as I said, every dish that she made. So we were familiar with everything. And it was when we were going off to... Like when we were finishing high school, she made sure we knew how to make chicken salad, dal, at least as a minimum, and roti jawal. When we mm -hmm. got to uni, we would call her and be like, how do you make biryani? How do you make balaa? My mum and my khala are the ones that really stuck to like cooking desi food. I mean, they mm -hmm. married desi men, so like Pakistani men, so they kind of had yeah. to. But aside from that, they're really good at it. My khala is amazing. She taught me how to make like uh, halwa puri and I made halwa puri at at uni. Well, wow. I think I just had that desire to show other people Pakistani culture because growing mm. up in a Western country, you do have a bit of a chip on your shoulder to kind of display your culture the way you know it. And I think food is a really easy way to share that without it being political, without it getting heavy. Just here, the street food kebab is not my culture. My culture isn't your dress. Like my culture isn't your drunken, you know, takeaway. It's actually <laughs> this. Like this is a homemade kebab. Taste it, and everyone's like, "Damn, this is amazing." Yeah. And the amount of people, I think I must have had a David. I must have like fed about mm, easily two hundred people at uni. Wow, that's awesome. Um, and yeah. everyone loves it. It's just so nice to. I think it was more yeah. for me because I grew up eating every single meal with my family. We're, it was only us five in every country and we would mm. have every meal that we could together every day. Mm. Um, so I needed that when I went out, like my sister got married, my brother left and I was just at uni and I think it did it more for me. So I got people around and we ate together and it's so nice. And I didn't have to think of any things to talk about. <laughs> I was like, here's food. Yeah. The sense of family was missing, right? That's, that's what you felt like yeah. in uni. And topics really come out of food. When you share food with someone, yeah. random topics come out, like great stories. It's so fun. Yeah, it's because you're forced to sit together <laughs> until you finish your food, right? Otherwise, yeah. if there's kind of a silence when you're just sitting next to each other, you'll just be like, well, okay, I got to go. But with food, <laughs> exactly, it's, it's a happy time. Yeah. And in my first year, I lived with uh, a lot of uh, girls from a lot of different cultures. So there was like yeah. 
a Lithuanian girl, my best friend, a Latvian, a Polish, one was British Filipino, one was Canadian. Mm -hmm. And I did this thing where I got everyone to cook a dish from their culture and we all sat together and it was delicious. They all got halal and meat and we ate together and it was so nice. It was honestly so nice. And we all started learning each other's languages a little bit. And it gave them a sense of home because they all came to England, obviously. And I think that's what made everyone really comfortable and close together. And we all respected each other after that. That's great. Yeah, it was just really nice. I love food. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. No, you do love food. (laughs) So yeah, (laughs) you've even shared a few pictures of your food on on Discord, right? Like stuff you've been making over Ramzan. So you made like Cindy lamb biryani the other day. You shared it. Oh, I Mm -hmm. I saw that. I remember getting hungry. (laughs) yeah even before that you shared another biryani like a week before that or something so <laughs> yeah. that's that must be i'm guessing one of your favorite foods to make i cook a lot so i'm called mini chef everyone calls me mini chef <laughs> yeah uh, do you make a uh, iftari every day with your um, mom or? we kind of share it my sister i know she shouldn't be traveling but she comes home with my niece um hmm. and she is the baker in the family so sometimes she cooks and we eat her food or i cook or my mum cooks. Sometimes my dad even cooks. I think as time has gone on and he's not in the office anymore, he cooks a mm. lot more. But yeah. yeah, predominantly it was always my mum for years. It was only when we started going to uni that we started kind of chipping in a little bit. But yeah, I always help. I always help. We right. have to. It's Pakistani custom. You know, you, you help oh, in yeah, the kitchen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Helps everybody out. I mean, you can chop the vegetables. I At the very least, I. <laughs> so again, this is stupid kind of, but when I got into Gordon Ramsay, I got really into trying to chop vegetables faster yes so i, so I got stupid? a you know a proper <laughs> knife and everything and he teaches these really cool techniques to cut an onion to cut you know vegetables and stuff yeah so I love uh yeah i started doing it and it works like i started chopping really fast exactly and really, yeah and and really safely too with the right technique there was one time i slipped up and then i i did cut a little piece of my finger <laughs> and then i had to go to the uh the urgent care center to oh, get no. that patched up but yeah <laughs> kept practicing and now i'm pretty good at it yeah, I was going to say people can now practice at home, but if they're going to be cutting mm-hmm. their fingers, it's probably not the best time. That's the thing. Yeah, right. There's no room for error. So yeah, you can <laughs> you can practice. Maybe practice with a with a, with something that looks like a knife, but isn't a, a knife. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. A, a fork or something. <laughs> Just to get the motion right. Yeah. But, yeah. but now like it's kind of a weird problem. I, I had to start learning to cook mm. after I moved out. So I was around 22, 23. Yeah. When I moved out and then, you know, there was no choice but to cook. And it's not like I didn't have an interest before, but again, my mom did everything. So like, who was going to eat my cooking if I just came out of nowhere and was like, move aside. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, like that wasn't going to impress anybody in the house. Yeah. But uh, when I moved out, I started watching YouTube videos and I started asking my mom over the phone how to make dishes and stuff. Mom's giving recipes doesn't help though. They'll be like, huh, thoras are I don't know, yeah. just essi, oh, yeah. vo daldo, namak exactly. bhi daldo. And you're That's like, the thing, kitna? Isn't... And they're like, yeah. Jesse bhi, just dekhlo. And you're like, what? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly what my mom would say, except in Punjabi. She'd be like, Bas munasab, bas cleaner, ho jai, bas. Yo, kar li, ho, api, api The I'm like, yes, okay. exactly. My mom was like, oh, so easy. Yeah. So get the, so even like dal, I was like, mom, how do I make dal? And in university kitchens, yeah. you're very limited in space in birth and size and everything you need to know measurements you know mm. and in ingredients oh yeah so i'm like a simple dal mom how do you make that okay so you get the yeah. dal uh you boil it you put in this this let it boil put the bagar in done and i'm like cool yeah. that sounds so easy i go to do it i'm like why didn't it turn out like that she was like oh <laughs> did you put that did you put the gas down did you put this in? I'm like, why are you telling me this now? You didn't tell me those steps before. She was like, that's obvious. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> Do you know what aga aga means in I, Malaysian? No, I don't. So that's another that's another linguistic thing now in combination mm-hmm. with cooking. But again, this comes from Gordon Ramsay when he went to Malaysia for yep. his show, and there was a Malaysian like master chef there. She was teaching him how to cook a Malaysian dish, right? And he was just trying to measure everything. He's like, how many cups are you using of this? How many teaspoons of this spice are you <laughs> using? And she'd get so mad at him. She'd be like, you know, you can't be so precise. You have to, for perfection, you have to do aga aga, yeah. Gordon. He'd be like, what's aga aga? So apparently aga aga means uh, like up to you or like you so-so, basically. Exactly, yeah. Which is so true. You know, you would just know, basically, 
You don't yeah. have to be so precise. Every dish is its own piece of art. And he'd be like, well, for me, that's super, super frustrating, but I guess I get it. But the thing is, Gordon says that, but if you see him make pasta or bread, he does it by the eye. They're like, yeah, about a cup. That's like mm. about tablespoons. They just don't realize they do it. Um, obviously, true, true. if you're learning yeah. another culture, you're like frustrated because you're like, I don't know what you know. Mm -hmm. So you have to give That's him measurements. But. Yeah. I mean, I've even seen Gordon like teach. Uh, I forgot what he was teaching, but he just said, use one tablespoon spoon of olive oil, just one tablespoon. And then it was literally him holding the bottle of olive oil upside down. And it was like, <laughs> glug, 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 glug. People, <laughs> I remember in that YouTube video, in the comments, people were like, uh, Gordon, <laughs> he said one tablespoon. It was so noticeable. He literally put in like maybe half a cup or a full cup of olive oil. <laughs> That's the thing that my mom does also. She's like, oh, you can put a tablespoon. I put this much, but you can do this. Mm. And I'm like, so which one? Like, wait, no, but which one do I do? And she's like, well, I do this. Yeah. You can yeah. do that. And your khala does this and your dad does this. But, you know, it's up to you. And I'm like, sat there like, <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just make a stir fry. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, what's funny is uh, when my brothers got married, right? So I, I think I mentioned I'm the youngest of five brothers. Mm -hmm. When they got married and uh, my bobby started coming home and for a while, we were all living together and my Bobby started cooking and my brothers started becoming more health conscious, more fitness oriented and stuff. So mm -hmm. they tell my Bobby's like, hey, our mom doesn't listen, but you can listen. Just use less oil, please. And so my Bobby would try to cook food dishes with less oil. But obviously, everybody, everybody in the house is going to eat it, right? Including my mom. So my mom would be like standing in the kitchen and she'd keep an <laughs> eye on these things. So as soon as she would get an opening into, you know, the, that, that cooking space, she would just slide right, in. the, right next to the stove and she would just, yeah, like throw in a bunch of oil on top. <laughs> because my mom, uh, and I think it's a Desi thing too, like we don't sacrifice taste oh, for yeah. health. And for me, it's the opposite. I'm okay with sacrificing a little bit of taste. Yeah, that's not my family at all. Growing up, like my mom was the one. I think having that British culture, she's very aware of health um and mm -hmm. fitness she always has been and because we were in a different country and my dad's an orphan so there's no sass she had full control of that and how ah. she brought us up and our fitness and stuff um mm -hmm. we didn't have a car so we were walking around a lot and my mom never used we don't use red chili because green chili is better uh, for your health anyway really okay yeah green chili is actually good for your health fresh yeah, green yeah. chili fresh anything is good for you fresh yeah but we don't use red chili powder. If we do, mm. it's very rarely, or if it's a guest, or it's a really special mm. thing. We just don't really yeah. like the taste that much. Uh, we don't use a lot of oil in anything. Because I've grown up that way, when I see those recipes, I'm like, oh my god, ew, your arteries. Mm. <laughs> you know, and my mom loved biology. So she would, if anything happened in the house, if we cut ourselves, yeah. we'd ask my mom, like, what's up? And she would tell you the scientific detail of what's going on in your body. And we're like, mom, I didn't ask that. Just, you know, tell us. <laughs> but she would do the same with food. She would tell us like the health benefits of this. Or like <laughs> my mom always told a different depth of like cooking. I think that's what got us interactive with it. She made us interactive in a way where she would be cooking something and she would say, you add haldi for digestion and mm -hmm. this. And then she would tell us the flavor profile of it. She would say, you put numak, but not too much because that'll do this to your body, you know? And she knew yeah. all of that, like the scientific, the health, the symbolism, the flavor. And, you know, it's so incredible to wow. grow up like that. And our mm -hmm. food has always been healthy Pakistani. I think that's mm -hmm. why I've had a passion for food so much, because I want to cook it for other people in the way I've been brought up with it. Like that yeah. fusion of British Desi mm -hmm. food, like which is kind of like healthy Pakistani food. And I want to make a business one day where I give people like healthy bucks. That's a good, food. that's a really good idea. Yeah. Because that's yeah. a really good angle. And it's a, it's a different angle because when I see pictures of your food, I don't notice that you've cut out any type of ingredient. At least it doesn't mm. look at, you know, it doesn't yeah. look like it has less oil. At least it, it looks pretty, pretty yeah. good and authentic. It's crazy. Cause especially since we got nonstick pans, you just use a tablespoon. You will not believe mm. I use a tablespoon of oil. Like wow. in a lot of for the whole dish. In, yeah. in most stuff. Yeah. Um, unless obviously it's sticking, so you add a bit more, yeah. like Gordon Ramsay style, you know, a tablespoon. Yeah, <laughs> glug, glug, glug. yeah, that's, yeah because that's a, I think that's the number one concern that people have. At least like it has to look appetizing, and they they just feel like if you cut out ingredients, it's not going to look it. So they yeah. don't even give it a chance. Yeah. So my mom said, as long as it looks good, trust me, yeah. people won't know. If it tastes the same, 
and it looks yeah. good, they will not know it's healthier for them. Of course they won't. Yeah. Um, right. But yeah, that's true. Yeah. Because I haven't been able to pull that off. Like when I cook, I purposely try to cook healthy. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people who are not in my family, they enjoy my cooking as well. But within my family, we have very strict standards. So yeah. if my family has to eat my food, they'll be like, and by the way, I'm <laughs> going to use your line. I actually like that line you threw, which was like, uh, you know, if they're like, you, your food, I'll be like, you, your arteries. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a good comeback. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> yeah. Next time I'll use that. Yeah. It's good, though, to have that kind of thing in your family, like high yeah. standards with taste, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. isn't a bad thing it just like makes you up your game all the time we're always kept on our toes yeah. as pakistanis in the family yeah. you're always on your toes you have to do your best yeah i like it and once you get comfortable in the kitchen and you kind of know what you're doing it gets a lot easier and it's yeah. actually therapeutic but you have to get past that point of like it's scary like with anything you do if you're starting the gym gym anxiety is a massive thing same mm -hmm. with like cooking you have to get past that point where like you you and the pan are not scared of each other. Nothing's going to happen. You can mess up. Mistakes are a good thing. And when you get past that point, it's so gratifying. Like getting your own ingredients, you have full control over your budget, your health, your tastes, everything. Like you cook what you want to eat and yeah. you know exactly what's going into your body. And Pakistani food's so cheap. No one understood mm. how in uni I spent 30 pounds a month on my food shopping. Wow. Um, and then I would have like 10 or 20 pounds to spare for like eating out. That's insane because mm. people spend 30 pounds a week. Oh, yeah. Did, did that include meat as well? I didn't really. OK, so I didn't really eat. I didn't really eat meat, but it did include mm. that. Uh, the butchers are really cheap here, though, like especially in Coventry yeah. where I was, I would get like drumsticks mm. or you just get chicken for a fiver. But yeah, if you're good with cooking and you've been doing it for a while, you yeah. will know which ingredients to pick up. Yeah. And that's something I really want to go on to do is like teach other students and other people how to like cook really well on a budget. Because I didn't just feed myself. I never cooked for me alone. Every single meal I cooked in uni, I cooked for another person. Like I don't yeah. think there was ever a time I just cooked for myself. Maybe breakfast right. when I had oats. But even that I would cook for my flatmates. I think it's a really good initiative. Yeah. And I think yeah. I want to throw this out too for the listeners. It's something that helped me, right? There's a, there's a little bit of stigma against using shan masala mm. by obviously experienced and more professional cooks. Like my mom, my mom or aunties in general, they will be a little judgmental. Same. They can taste the shan masala in some people's dishes and then they'll come home like, oh, same. You have to start somewhere. <laughs> yeah. But when you start, when you're starting out cooking, honestly, I think one of the reasons people get discouraged or intimidated is because they see cooking seems so hard because there's so many different spices to look out yeah. for and so many different vegetables and stuff. But exactly. shan masala can actually be really, really helpful for that. You know, it tastes very good, too. So it can be a great place to start. Great way to start for the first, you know, several months of cooking, at least. Absolutely. The only thing scary about desi food is the spices. That's yeah. the thing that, trust me, everyone is figuring out once you realize that everyone is winging it and no one knows it's fine um the only yeah. thing that makes every dish different is the amounts of spices of everything but as long as you know that you know you only put garam masala and meats and uh, for vegetables you don't put it in you just basically have haldi salt cumin or zira mm. it's fine like it's the spice mix that gets everything confusing but mm. nowadays you just type in a recipe whatever ingredient you have write that in like kidney bean curry chickpea mm. curry like anything and then if you get a plate put the spices in i promise you your cooking experience in the kitchen will be so much less scary because mm. other than that spice mix everything is easy you literally just put onions in a pan then you mm. put in you know the spice or the tomato water you chuck in the ingredient that's it that's literally it mm. and then you let it boil it's that mm. spice bit that that's scary. So yeah, yeah use a packet. Right. Who cares? It's better than yeah. Use a packet, cooking. honestly. Yeah. Yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah. There is a specific dish on my mind that I think everybody can start off with, but I thought maybe you could answer first. A specific dish, like a very simple desi dish that somebody can start off with, which basically is something that I started off with. Like if you don't know how to cook. Hmm. I'm not sure actually, because everything I recommended to my friends, like I want to say white friends, but non-Pakistani friends. They never found those easy, like hmm. dal or 
they never found them uh, as easy. They found, yeah. for some reason, kebab really easy. I have people yeah. all around the world now making kebabs. <laughs> you know, kachiki make kebabs. Yeah. Um, because it's yeah, just yeah. dicing stuff and putting it in a bowl and then making patties and putting it in the freezer. And you mm. have kebabs for days. And yeah. the other thing, I guess, would be dal. Like masoor dal. That's the thing. Like with dal, if you're using a pressure cooker, like I have the uh, instant pot, right? Mm-hmm. Dal is like the easiest thing to make. You have to literally throw in the spices with water. It's so true. Yeah. And that's yeah. it. It comes out and you give it a little bit of tarka. Even that's optional. Exactly. And that's it. it. Like my heart, it fills with pride when I see my friends in Canada yeah. and like other places like making dal. It's so cool. <laughs> and I feel like it, of desi dishes, dal is probably the biggest bang for your buck. Yeah. It yeah, makes the biggest impact. money, everything. <laughs> it tastes so good for, for such little effort. It tastes so good. But often you find that in every culture, like people rave mm-hmm. about fish and chips and like chips here. And it's the cheapest food, you know, mm. you have that in every culture, like the simplest foods taste so good. Yeah. And it's so easy to make. But yeah, dal, everyone should learn dal for sure. Everybody. Yeah. Right. So for me, because I love chicken so much, I rarely go a day without chicken. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what I started off with was aloo kima. Ooh. Like chicken kima, like, you know, like minced chicken. Yes. And yes. it cooks so fast too, honestly, like minced chicken, you just have to throw in a few spices and it cooks exactly. very, very fast with garlic and ginger and then uh, you just boil potatoes on the side and I love potatoes too so I mix those in and that's I think that's the very first desi dish that I learned how to cook and and I remember when I first learned how to make it I made it for like three months in a row I didn't make anything else you know actually same I think the first thing I cooked was chicken gasan like aloo and chicken yeah everyone should cook with meats because that's the thing that's scary not chicken but like Mm -hmm. meat like beef and lamb yeah because that's i think what looks really scary but it's weirdly really easy kima mm-hmm. kebab like you said um like yeah. aloo kima do it i just want everyone to cook i think the podcast has just turned into food as i knew it, it would it, it is you're right you're right <laughs> yeah no it's fun because i like talking about food as well you ask anyone that knows me the word arfa or ari just means food my dissertation was on food my first job was yeah. in a restaurant like everything about me is just about food. <laughs> about food. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. The other thing people should play around with is jowl. Do you mm-hmm. have a like your favorite way of making jowl? Because I definitely found mine. I used to make uh, jowl in my rice cooker, but then I started I started cooking it on the stove in a pan. So I cook, oh. I usually cook brown rice, by the way, because I'm more like health conscious. So I don't cook white rice as much. I want brown rice so much. But my family are yeah. against it. Like my oh yeah, dad my family too. And my mom. <laughs> is that a Pakistani thing? Because they just like look down on brown rice. Like if I ever say yeah, if I ever say I want brown rice, they'll say Q. Like why? You mm. know. But to be mm. fair, we eat everything yeah. else yeah. healthy, but mm. they're like why? Just have white not, not the brown rice, yeah. <laughs> Which is funny because like I guess it's a person to person thing, but to me, I do get that white rice has a softer texture, so it's easier to chew on. But brown rice isn't that much of a hassle for me. Yeah, my family. They look at brown rice and they literally make this face as if like they've seen the worst thing ever. Like they just saw somebody die. They make yeah. that type of face. Why is that this stigma? <laughs> <laughs> we have like mixed atta for our roti. We have like, yeah. brown, we always eat brown bread. Yeah. So I'm like, why don't we have brown rice? And we're such health fanatics. So yeah, that's what I don't get. Like for, you advocate health for everything. But then if I even mention brown jowl, they're like, why? Mm. Like, you. <laughs> What, what, do, what do you want to do with it? Seriously. What do you want yeah, to do? Yeah. I suggested, I just made an idea. I didn't even say we're going to do it. I just made, an, made a suggestion that we try brown rice with oh, like, brown They were about to hang me. Like, I said the most ridiculous thing. I was just like, oh, you're crazy, you're not understanding. You're not understanding. I was like, dude, it was just an idea. I'm not saying, yeah, let's do it. But yeah, they're like, we don't, sacri- we don't uh, you know... <laughs> You do it right if you're going to do it, okay? I was like, okay. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. There's always a right way to do things and I'm never aware of it. Like, I think the first time mm. I made kima, I was so proud I'd come home and make kima. My parents are like, why is there nothing in it? It's just sada kima. Like, mm. you have to put aloo in it at least and mutter. And I was like, oh, I didn't know that was a thing. Yeah. And I'm always late to those customs, you know. <laughs> a late adopter. <laughs> or I made like um kitri with dal and they're like why would you make dal with kitri like hmm. it has dal in it and i was like oh damn i didn't know that was a thing 
Mm. Like, isn't that so logical? But if you're not, I don't know, I just didn't think of it that way. And they were like, no, you're supposed to make this kind of jowl with it. But so I'm still yet to learn those little things. Yeah. Um, well, who knows? You might come up with something, something new, something yeah. different that way. <laughs> Having a kind of a outsider perspective. Yeah. <laughs> so you were, you were going to mention what, what is your favorite way of cooking rice? Yes. So one thing I found, we've never had a rice cooker ever. And yeah. I don't think any of my family have. My brother recently got one and is defiantly like, we should have one. Every other Asian here has one. Just mm -hmm. get a rice cooker. But I think it's a pride thing in my family. That they don't have rice cookers. <laughs> so for most of my life when I was cooking, I found jowl really difficult because I would always have napava jowl. Like I mm. would measure it. I never could figure out like how to make it just free. I don't know how to say it, like freehand. I would ask my mom and she was like, it's so easy. You just boil it. And third year, mm. as I was going to leave, I figured out the best way ever. Maybe my mamani told me, but she said, you get rice, whatever amount, it doesn't matter. You put in however much water, it doesn't matter. You don't even need to like rinse it. You boil it on full. Mm -hmm. As soon as it starts boiling, keep it on full for three minutes, drain it, put it back in the pan, put the lid on it. You can add a bit of oil, put the lid on it, put it on the lowest gas for 10 minutes and then just turn the gas off after 10 minutes. Don't lift the lid for like another 10 minutes. Oh. And it is perfect every single time, every single time. It's perfect. Wow. And I've told everyone, just try mm. it. It's great. If you have really cheap rice, then I would say boil it on full for three minutes, drain, uh, then put it on low gas with a lid for seven minutes mm -hmm. and then turn the gas off. But yeah. seriously, it I'll works. If anyone can be bothered, please do try it. Okay. Like I wouldn't tell you this specifically if I didn't, if I didn't have full confidence in it. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Then I gotta, I gotta try that. Yeah. Because I usually don't drain. I just go straight, you know, put in the right amount of water and then I wait for it to come to a full boil. And then I put the lid on, uh, turn the mm -hmm. heat on low. And then wait about 20 minutes and it's done. Yeah, exactly. But, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, no, I'll try this. Yeah. Yeah. Once I discovered that, I was like, why did I waste so much time? <laughs> All this time, it's like perfect. You know, we take pride in like mm -hmm. separate dane, you know, like mm -hmm. that's a very Pakistani thing to have like completely karivid, like separate. Yeah. Nice and soft. Yeah. And it's like that every single time. Wow. Um, yeah. And my guru friends all do the same now. They're like, oh, I never mm. appreciated rice before. And once you have good rice, you can't go back. And I'm like, okay, mm. don't go too far. But yeah. <laughs> mm. I find it so interesting. You mentioned your gore friends so many times, even in the, the last podcast with, with the lockdown discussion, right? You mentioned how mm -hmm. your roommates started using Lota. And uh, <laughs> now like you're talking about how they, they're like they sharing food with you. You're sharing food with them and techniques. <laughs> like, I find that so cool because... That's something I don't see over here. And I don't know if this is a UK thing, just because there's a higher number of Pakistanis and, you know, kind of a Muslim influence over there than the US in general. I think that might just be an Arfa thing. I'm not going to lie to you. Or an Arfa thing. Yeah. So it's just you. <laughs> You're just that special. <laughs> but that's also... No, I'm not special, but I think... I don't know what it is, but I think because I'm so interested in other people's culture and I don't find anything awkward to talk about or like, I just encourage people to just do it or try mm -hmm. something they're willing to do it back and mm -hmm. i let people say whatever they want like everyone grows up with racial stigmas and stigmas in general and we all have different knowledges and grow up with limited experience in certain things and i've never been shy of that i think growing up in different countries and meeting different people who've never seen a brown person even like in italy i met people who were like I was a kid, I was probably like five and they were like, mm. you're the first brown person I've met. Like I, I've grown up with that kind of thing. So I never get offended by that. And I've let people say whatever they want. And I mm. think after that, you build like such a strong bond that people would really love to get stuck in. I think people just like to get heard. And yeah. I found that a lot of the people around me are so willing to just try cultural things and get stuck mm. in also they get free food habib so they'll come around so have there you go <laughs> free food and then <laughs> yeah, they'll yeah, try it that. yeah and then i'll get them kind of addicted to pakistani food then they'll make it themselves mm -hmm. and if they come into my house to eat they have to take their shoes off they'll see the lota in the in the bathroom you know they'll see the way i'm like can we all pick up our dishes together we all eat together you know so there's no way of avoiding my culture you'll you meet me you see it kind yeah. of thing and i think yeah. the other thing is you 
the way you show interest in their culture, right? I think that makes a big difference too. Somebody has to take the the step forward first. Yeah. And it seems like you do that. You you've mentioned how you have such a strong interest in learning different languages. Yeah. So like that type of behavior, that type of uh, personality and attitude that you have is probably yeah. what gets people into thinking about you as well, like kind of reciprocating that positivity for positivity, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a very good quality you have. Thank you. I appreciate that. I tried. Mm -hmm. I did want to mention your last question was about combining British values with Muslim. Mm -hmm. Because the, those are the two identities that really clash. British and Muslim mm -hmm. don't go together. If you were Indian growing up here, you could at least drink with like the, the, the drink, yeah. and stuff. But yeah, I think the, the way my mum brought us up. Oh, the one thing she made a point to do was teach us Islam, um, but away from Pakistani culture. So when we learned mm -hmm. about our Pakistani culture, we never learned like anything that crosses with Islam that much. So you know how mm -hmm. you people celebrate like the prophet's birthdays and mm, those yeah. kind of events we didn't know anything about that we didn't know about like i don't know we didn't even learn the ghazali even though my granddad used to sing on the radio like ghazals mm. and stuff oh wow because my mom brought us up muslim separate from pakistani culture mm -hmm. she taught us the things that she loves of islam and it was really empowering the way she talked about islam because she said we won't feel the peer pressure of drinking like growing up and she just flipped the script in so many ways. When I was in school, I met a lot of people who didn't want to be drinking at such a young age, actually. Mm. And um, like going to parties and stuff, which I didn't think I would find. Like Muslims or non-Muslims? Not Muslims. When I went to school, I didn't meet any Muslims, by the way. Mm. I didn't have a huge exposure to Muslims. It was only I see. when I came to the place I am now and we found the masjid that we found. I was like, whoa, so many Muslims. Like... I grew up in Italy, like there wasn't any Pakistanis, never mind Muslims. Of course, yeah. So I've always grown up around Goria. That's probably why you've heard me talk about them in other episodes, like non-Muslim mm. friends. All my friends have always been like non-Muslim. Mm. Um, and they would use me as an excuse, use my friendship as empowering them to get out of peer pressure. So if someone was talking about going to a party, they'd be like, oh no, Arfa can't go, so I won't go. And they would use me in that way. And I was like, just blame me. It's fine. Mm. They're like, oh, I'm not going to drink because she doesn't drink. And they didn't want to. And I thought that was so cool. Um, and if people ever said to me like, oh, you don't drink. I was like, I never have and never will. And mm. saying it like that, they were like, whoa, like, what do you yeah. mean? Like, and I was like, I've never been curious and I, I will never do it. I just don't. I, it's not mm. something I'm ever going to do, but it's cool that you guys do. Mm. Um, and they have so many questions. It's funny. And I was like, I find it sad that most of the people, when I ask, why do you drink? They can't give an answer. And the most they'll say is, oh, like to relax or I don't know, it's a social thing or whatever. And I was like, but mm. I can socialize with you and not drink. Like I know I've learned how to relax. I've learned how to have fun and right, be crazy right. like, yeah. without it. Like, I think it would have been cool if people got the choice a bit more. In England, I know that mm. people didn't really have the choice. You just kind of grow up and you do it, mm -hmm. you know, in the same way yeah. you have other cultures. But mm -hmm. yeah, but I found Islam empowering in those ways. That's 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 really cool. And it feels like, I don't know, like every time you tell your stories, it feels so unique because I don't know anybody who is like that. <laughs> like, I, don't, I, I, don't, I, I haven't met a lot of there are people here. There are there are non-Muslims yeah. here, of course, that that don't drink. But they're mm. they're few and far in between. It's a little hard to find them, especially yeah. at the age when you're at university or college. So in, in yeah. my university, my university was a big party school. So on the weekends, uh, all the kids, I guess, maybe this was part of the reason, but all the kids who did not party, they would go home to avoid that. So I would be one of the kids going home more often than not. Yeah. Everybody staying back would be partying, like be insane. I would hear stories oftentimes of like people being knocked out by the bathrooms, you know, throwing up everywhere. Like police had to be called at this house and police had to be called yeah. at that club. So it, it was just insane. Like couches would be lit on fire. Exactly. You know, kids would do stupid things when drunk. Same thing here. And the, and the more I would hear about those things, the more discouraged I would get to even want to be involved in that, you know? Yeah. I was just like, this is yeah. dumb. It doesn't even seem fun. Same. Yeah. In school, like they would do the same because you'd see on American movies, films, that this crazy thing happened when these kids had a party and I think there was yeah. a pressure to create memories mm -hmm. as teenagers so 
they would have these parties, but they're really lame in England. It's not the same as like America. <laughs> and yeah. They felt the need to come up with all these stories and be like, oh, George or whatever, like got so drunk he did this and did this. that. <laughs> and I started noticing just like, you're just doing, you're just saying that for the sake of it. It didn't seem like anyone really had that much fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd just rather just sit at home and eat good food. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, very true. <laughs> or I invited like my friends around for a sleepover and stuff. Cool, thanks everyone. Perfect. Fun. Talk to you soon. Okay. All right. Sound like him. Yep, sound like him. Bye. Hope you enjoyed this discussion with Arfa. As much as she and we all love talking about food, Arfa was interested in coming back for another episode in the future to discuss a topic other than food. Is there something in specific that you'd like her to speak about or do you have any comments or feedback for us in general? Email us at hello at popcorn.com or DM us on Instagram to get in touch. Thanks for tuning in and see you next time. Mm -hmm.